It's Visual Radio, program number 373. It's the uh, 25th of January, 2007. And one of our co-hosts from long ago, Joe Tortelli, is back today, a big Beach Boys fan. And on the phone, we have Peter Ames Carlin, author of Catch a Wave, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson. Hello, Peter. Hi, guys. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. How are things going on the book, Peter? They're going great, as far as I can tell. I mean, my actual work on it ended a while ago, but, uh, but it seems like people are uh, finding it and reading it and responding to it, so, you know, that's all good. Now, you're an author yourself. How did you get uh, the idea of writing a volume on specifically Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys? Because, I mean, I've been a big fan, borderline fanatic for, you know, three decades or more since I was a kid, and, uh, yeah, I kept looking for a book that was going to, you know, tell the story in a way that I thought it needed to be told, and, and I never found it, so at some point I figured I'd better go ahead and write it myself. Well, now, that I, I think we all know there have been a, a number of books written on the Beach Boys, and including one that I think Brian wrote his own sort of autobiography. How uh -huh. do you, what angle or, or perception do you take that you didn't find in some of those other volumes? Well, what I was really trying to do was to connect his story in particular and the Beach Boys in general to, uh, you know, the larger, so, you know, arc of American popular culture, because what always seemed to be um, the most important thing about their music to me was something that other people didn't talk about, which was the way that it restated or, you know, uh, echoed a lot of the same ideas and ideals and failings that have, you know, that you see repeatedly coming up in American popular culture. Um, a lot of very traditional cultural ideas that have filtered down through, you know, the centuries uh, in America has, I think, has always been very present in both Brian's work and in the, you know, the, the actual story of, of his life and the lives of everyone in his family. So uh, even though the group is very much seen as part of the sort of revolutionary 1960s, the counterculture, the whole, uh, the, the whole pop scene that was happening in the 60s, you try to connect them to uh, a whole history of American music. Yeah, and I think that you know, just be, and, and I think they are in fact a large part of that '60s culture. But, 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 but even so, that doesn't mean that they're not, you know, that they're not also part of of this larger, you know, more historical tradition. I think just you know, a lot of the, um, the yeah, yeah, a lot of what they had to say was just putting a modern veneer on these traditional ideas, and I think that's just, you know, I, but, but that happens again and again through through the generations. Uh, you know, people speak in the language that they're familiar with. They tell stories about the life that they know, um, and yet, you know, what I think that the transcendent thing about the Beach Boys and Brian is the fact that though the action in the songs and, and you know, are very particular to a time and a place, the feelings that that, that he's really tapping into uh, go beyond that, you know, very far beyond that. And that's, I think, why people continue to listen to the music to this day. Do you have um, some personal favorites yourself, either among their more famous songs, singles, or albums uh, that, that brought you to their music? Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, as a kid, I was always, I, I, there was, when they, um, Capitol released Endless Summer in 1974. I mean, that was the record that really brought me to their door. I mean, that was my point of entry, you know, and for, I think, a mil you know, millions of other fans at the time, because uh, I'd never really heard that music as a younger kid, but when I was, when that record came out, it was a, a big eye-opening experience, and from there, uh, you know, I mean, I very, you know, relatively quickly began to, you know, uh, snap up of, uh, as many of the records as I possibly could. Um, so, you know, you kind of begin with the early stuff because it's so accessible and so fun. And then, I, you know, I, I, within a year or two, I found a copy of Pet Sounds, and, and that kind of really opened my eyes that there was a much larger thing going on. Um, certain tunes that I come back to again and again, I mean, I think, uh, you know, everybody knows the hits, but for me, it's, you know, the some of the more sort of relatively obscure tunes like busy doing nothing or I went to sleep or sail on sailor and 
tunes like that that I thought really, you know, uh, captured something very vivid and, and uh, vital about, uh, you know, Brian's artistry. Peter, um, The Endless Summer, I find that intriguing. You had heard stuff on the radio, though, right? Well, you know, it's weird. I don't really remember in, hearing any Beach Boy tunes until uh, American Graffiti came out in, the ah. middle, in 1973. Because I'd always been a huge Beatles fan. I mean, I was born in 1963, so... Um, and, but, you know, my folks had Beatle records, and so I listened to that stuff and the Monkees and, and that kind of stuff as a little kid. And I was, you know, my first love was always the Beatles. But, um, you know, and it wasn't until I saw American Graffiti and my brother came home with that record that uh, and that had Surf and Safari and All Summer Long on it. And those, you know, those kind of leaped out at me. You know, most of the record is early, you know, late 50s, early 60s type early rock and roll. But, the, you know, the only real sound of, you know, the early to mid 60s is, you know, are those Beach Boys tunes. And particularly all summer long, because it has such a, you know, that's really, Brian was really beginning to open his musical palette at that point. And that's got like, I think a marimba is the lead instrument on that tune. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was really the point where, you know, the first time I ever heard those voices and heard that sound. And then it was, you know, about a year later when Endless Summer came out. And, and then suddenly I was aware of, of, you know, a much larger swath of their music. So you didn't so much uh, grow up with them uh, in the 60s as uh, discover them uh, in the 70s. Yeah, I was a real second wave kind of fan, you know. Um, cause it, and that's one of the things, I mean, when I, you know, as I... Uh, you know, my fascination deepened, and, and they kind at the same time that they were around, but were more of a nostalgia band. People always talked about them as being, you know, so um, such a part of of the '60s, and that that anyone's interest in them was was limited to their interest in that moment in time. And you know, I always had a, a you know a fascination for the '60s. I mean, it's a real intriguing part of our history. But, you know, I mean, I have no real nostalgic connection to it because I didn't really live it in that way. I mean, I was in preschool at the time or, you know, in diapers. So, you know, obviously <laughs> <laughs> my perception of it was, was different from, from my elders. Um, but, you know, the music still connected to me in a, or I connected with it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a real intense kind of visceral way, which is one of the reasons why, you know, I really wanted to explore know where it fit into this larger cultural tradition because I, I felt like you know it really doesn't have anything to do with with the 60s in the same way that the power of surfing USA has really nothing to do with surfing as a sport I mean I don't know anyone who surfs I mean you guys <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean I mean I think 99% of Americans have probably never even been in the same you know knowingly been in the same room with a surfboard and yet uh, you know What's interesting is the fact that they make that sound like such a vital and, you know, familiar experience because I think, you know, they invest as much passion and as much, you know, uh, power into that culture as Mark Twain put into, uh, you know, the riverboats in the Mississippi and, uh, you know, Melville did in the, in, in the whaling uh, culture in, you know, in Cape Cod. I mean, you don't have to have stepped on a whaling ship to understand, uh, you know, the power of, of, of Moby Dick. I noticed you titled the book uh, after one of the early Beach Boys uh, songs, Catch a Wave. Uh, is there a particular meaning to that song, or do you just like the title in the context of what you were writing about? Oh, yeah, no, there's, uh, I really, one of the things that jumped out at me about that song in particular as I, as I began this project was, you know, uh, it, it, that song itself, I mean, people think of it, I mean, on the surface, it's, 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 it's almost like an evangelical surfing song. It's like, you know, it has, it has this ringing chorus of catch a wave and you're sitting on top of the world, you know, as though this was really, you know, the surest path to spiritual transcendence. And yet the verses are, are full of, of warnings, you know, about horrible things that could happen to you in pursuit of this, you know, of this divine moment. I mean, uh, that, that, that the waves are deadly, that there are these mean guys on the beach who are going to make fun of you because you're a surfer, and, uh, you know, that. so essentially what it comes down to is it describes this journey as, you know, this, this surfing experience as being both transcendent and, 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 
you know, and, and potentially deadly, which I think gets to the heart of so many of those early Beach Boy tunes, which people think of as being carefree and sun-washed, and yet there's always some sort of darkness on the horizon. You know, there's always, they're about this journey away from sorrow or from danger, but, but you know, there's always something looming, you know. Even in I, a, a song like I Get Around, they talk about, like, these bad guys, you know. The bad guys know us and they leave us alone. But even acknowledging the existence of bad guys... <laughs> to me is important because it, it, it invests a kind of tension into their songs. Is that like an osmosis from a neurotic control freak with well-documented problems regarding impulse control? <laughs> Do you think the love of Phil Spector kind of rubbed off? That's your quote in page 45 <laughs> oh. on oh. Phil Spector. Yeah. The bad guys. Well, you know, I mean, I think that Brian has been obsessed with Spectre for 45 years now, and I think, you know, to a great extent because of, um, you know, obviously, this, you know, the sound of Spectre's recordings, you know, had a huge impact on him, but I think also his relationship with Phil had always been very um, unhappy that, you know, I think he really admired and, and worshipped Phil, and Phil was very uncomfortable with that, and I think ritually, you know, tried to humiliate Brian. I mean, you go back, I mean, the anecdotes are kind of awful, but Brian grew up in a house where, you know, his father was both, you know, was, was just both passionately in love with his sons and also just completely unable to express that love in a healthy way. So, you know, for all that he sacrificed for the guys and for all that he really did everything he possibly could to, you know, make their ambitions come true, um, you know, he tormented them in a terrible way. And I think, you know, that's a primal relationship that, you know, that neither Brian nor either of his brothers ever really got beyond. Um, and I think it's, you know, that colors the music, it darkens the music, it's darkened their whole experience in life. And that's part of the tension that, you know, that makes their story so fascinating and at times awful. Um, and, you know, I mean, you can see it repeating again and again in Brian's, you know, personal and professional relationships. Um, yeah, and the Phil Spector thing was, was you know, was just par for the course. Of course, you do go in quite a bit in the book into the relationship, as you said, of the, Brian and his brothers with the father, Murray Wilson. And one can sort of say that they never would have made it without Murray, but then it was his continuing interference in battles with them that uh, cast that pall, as you indicate, uh, over the rest of their lives at the same time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all about the paradox, I mean, which, you know, held true for the entire, you know, the entire scope of, 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 of Murray's life. And, um, you know, and then I think in every, practically every relationship Brian's had ever since. I mean, I've been paying very close attention to the guy's life and career for more than 30 years, and through that entire time, I mean, you always get the sense that, oh, if, you know, Brian could only get beyond this one kind of abusive and, you know, or bullying person or someone who's dominating him, then, boy, you know, he could be capable, he could be happy for once and capable of anything. But the fact is, is that Brian... You know, I think those are the kinds of relationships that he's comfortable with, and he has a lot more um, uh, control over his life and his relationships, and people tend to give him credit, which isn't to say that, you know, he has always chosen the most healthy relationships, and I think that, you know, but, but he's definitely chosen the most comfortable ones, which to him, I think, are ones where, you know, someone else serves as an exoskeleton to him, you know, and... and serves as an external authority and, and something to add structure to his life. Because without that, you know, I think he feels like he's going to float off into, uh, you know, the, the endless void. But, but you know, those people are, uh, you know, not always making the best creative and professional decisions for him. But, you know, that's just what he's used to. Uh, <clears throat> Peter, do, do you think it was because they were the same age? Uh, you know, it, seem, it would seem a sense that Mike Love would have been the perfect person within the group to take that role, but it seem, doesn't seem like Brian would ever uh, sort of be subservient to him or, or, or there was always a tension between them. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, Mike, uh, you know, and his mother was uh, Murray's sister, 
uh, yeah, Murray's sister. They were, you know, Brian and Carl and Dennis, the, the three Wilson brothers, were first cousins to uh, to Mike. And, um, you know, and Mike was in some ways tainted by the same kind of, tr- you know, trouble, family experience that the Wilsons were. Uh, but he, he emerged from his childhood, I think, far more confident and far more, uh, you know, assertive. Um, and, uh, you know, to some extent, he... You know, he certainly helped write some, uh, you know, some of the some of their hits in the in the early to mid '60s, uh, and kept the boys really on a you know lashed to this very ambitious course through the you know through the '70 you know '60s, '70s, '80s, '90s, you know, all the way up until today. But uh, um, you know, I I don't know if he was always the most simpatico artistic partner because he's been very focused on the audience very focused on success and generally not the least bit interested or, or <laughs> not all that interested in, in, in you know, in, in, in art, which, which is a shame because Brian, I think at his heart, is, is an artist. Um, and Mike had a very limited patience for that kind of, you know, artistic daring do. So when Brian really began to explore the outer limits of, of his creativity, Mike was not necessarily on board for the journey, and in fact, you know, may have, uh, you know, actively discouraged or actively tried to undermine what Brian was up to. He probably was also upset that he was getting cut cut out of the lyrics too. Yeah, there was that. Ex- yeah, he was, and that was both a professional and a personal insult to him. I think. I mean, I think there was a time when he and Brian were particularly close, and I think he valued his cousin's, you know, friendship and. Uh, and I think when Brian really, you know, sort of threw him over and um, began to work with other guys, I think that that, you know, I mean, uh, it hurt his feelings. And uh, and that was a hurt that really defined, I think, a lot about that group and a lot about their inability to work together. You know, and there was, uh, you know, certainly some ego involved, too. So, um, you know, you tie all these things together along with, you know, family tensions that have been going on since well before the guys were born, and uh, you know, it's kind of a rat's nest. How many of the um, principals, um, either Beach Boys themselves or people associated with the group, were you able to interview for uh, the book Catch a Wave, um, Peter Carlin? Um, a lot of them, actually. I mean, I actually, uh, I mean, virtually all of, you know, the, the, well, certainly the surviving Beach Boys, and I actually just through happenstance, you know, had spoken to both Carl and Dennis Wilson, both of whom had passed away before they died, um, and, you know, and had interactions with them. Um, you know, and I interviewed Brian a whole bunch of times and spent, you know, s- s- significant time with him over the years. And, uh, you know, and I had, a, you know, I've had a few interviews and one particularly long sit down with Mike Love and, uh, you know, and the other guys. So, um, you know, and then and I was also particularly interested in, in, in talking to uh, Brian's collaborators. I mean, Tony Asher, the guy that co-wrote Pet Sounds and Van Dyke Parks, who co-wrote Smile, um, you know, the very ambitious and long unreleased album that he was working on as a follow-up for Pet Sounds. So it was shelved for, you know, more than 35 years. Um, and, you know, other guys he'd worked with along the way, a guy named David Sandler, um, Andy Paley, uh, you know, Joe Thomas, a lot of these guys I'd, you know, I'd, I'd managed to spend time with. And I was particularly interested in hearing about just, you know, how the guy wrote music. I mean, what his interaction with his muse was and, you know, how he went about his creative business. And it was always, you know, and that was to me, you know, the most important stuff to get. We've got a little surprise for you, too. Um, uh, Nick Vinay was a very good friend of mine. Oh, really? And um, when he passed away, uh, do you know the songwriter Harriet Shock? She wrote uh, Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady for uh, Helen Reddy. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. And Barry Gordy's Last Dragon, she did the theme song. Yeah, yeah. So Nick was dating Harriet at the end. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, he passed away before I got a chance to interview him. Uh Uh-huh. And we'd talk on the phone for hours, of course, at night. And uh, I'd say, oh, I love that song, Lot of Love. And he goes, Joe, I'm looking at Nicolette Har- Larson's house right now from his house. <laughs> and then she, of course, passed on, too. Yeah. 
But I said, Harriet, we've got to find some video of Nick. I've got to have him on the show, even, you know, after. Mm -hmm. She tracked it down. She found a public access show where Nick was on. And after your show is broadcast, we're going to broadcast a tribute to Nick Vinay with Nick on the show. Oh, cool. So, uh, you know, we'll send that out to you. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, I'd love to see that. And I was uh, actually, I was quite... Uh disappointed that I never got a chance to talk to Nick because I'm sure he was full of great stories and uh, and I would have loved to have had a chance to uh, to dig into his memories. And of course uh, Andy Paley who you mentioned was a long time uh, Boston resident himself. Yeah yeah you know I just bumped into Andy in LA uh, a week or two ago and had a chance to catch up and talk to him for a while so he's uh, he's a great guy. Joe T actually interviewed him when he did the Shag soundtrack Oh, really? Because I was managing the recording studio in 1988. Uh-huh. Boy, that was like 19 years ago. But Andy's a great guy. Yeah, 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 he is. He's a really cool guy. And I was just, I've just been listening to this record that he produced with uh, Tom Kenny, from, uh, who does the voice for SpongeBob SquarePants. But they made a kid's record sort of, you know, with the SpongeBob characters that's actually got a lot of cool people on it, including Brian Wilson. Oh, boy. Yeah, and uh, it's a really neat record. I mean, uh, it's got some really, and Andy's got such a great ear for uh, for production. And layer, you know, he's really, you know, obviously a huge uh, Brian Wilson aficionado, along with a friend and longtime collaborator. And so he can really, uh, you know, he can really make the studio sing. So is that a, a brand new record, the the uh, chil the children's uh, album? Yeah, yeah. I think it's called the Best Day Ever. Ah, and wow. so I've been driving around with my kids and listening to that a lot in the car, and, and they're all huge fans now. Well, that, that, that's fun, and that's a big market because SpongeBob is huge, and uh, ch kids, kids stuff, music in general is, is really taken off, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, there's some really cool stuff, and, uh, you know, and a lot of interesting musicians getting involved in that. Um, Peter, among the... Uh, did, you, did you get to speak to Al Jardine as well? Yeah, I did. Um, Al, you know, Al's a real interesting guy, and, uh, you know, I had talked to him, you know, 20 years ago or something when I, you know, was doing some Beach Boys thing, uh, you know, as a newspaper reporter, and then um, I had been trying to, we'd sort of had this this weird long walk up to an interview, and first he was really interested in doing it, and then he didn't want to do it, and then he was kind of a little, you know, pissy about the whole thing, and then, but then I guess a bunch of people were calling him, and, uh, so my phone rang one day, and I picked it up, and he said, uh, yeah, this is Al. Um, everyone keeps telling me to talk to you, so I guess I better talk to you. And it was pretty late in the game, but, uh, you know, he I spent, you know, an hour or two with him on the phone, and uh, and he had a lot of interesting stories to tell. Do the, do the three of them um, like each other and sue each other, or do they all hate each other and sue each other? I think they've love each other and sue each other <laughs> and liking each other is a whole other kettle of fish. I think that uh, you know like any family you know even if they don't really know how to get along I think there is a deep-seated affection and love for one another that kind of you know that exists beneath these you know these layers of, of, of discontent and un, you know and, and frustration um, you know, I, I I don't know how healthy I don't you know their relationships are or how good they are for each other to the extent that you can define that. But uh, I mean, I think certainly, I mean, especially you know they all got together up on that Capitol Records rooftop a couple months back to you know get a whatever it was a platinum record uh, award or whatever, and uh, you know and that was the first time I think they had all been in one place in 10 years or more. Oh my. But, uh, you know, everyone I knew who was up there said that it was remarkable how, uh, you know, really beneath it all, they still seem to really care for each other. Well, that's good because what's really um, disturbing to me was when Nick Vinay was um, in the hospital and I had no idea he was dying. Mm -hmm. He'd been in the hospital uh, a few times towards the end and I thought, oh, you know, he'll get out of this. Right. Uh, they were serving, uh, he was doing depositions in the hospital. So when you bring that up, I'm like, like how horrible this poor guy's like, you know, trying to recover. Yeah. And he's got lawyers there, and he's given depositions. Yeah. It was just really, I thought, kind of striking that, and, and Joe brings it up, and he's right. Can we all get along? Yeah, you would think, but you know, I mean, I think that uh, 
you know, again, it's not, I don't think it's really about the money. It's not really about any, I mean, it, it, it's about, I think, these tensions and, and hostilities that have sort of enraptured that family for generations. And I think, uh, you know, the guys that we know as the Beach Boys are just kind of enacting their part in that family tradition. And uh, it's it's tragic and awful. I mean, especially, the, you know, the great irony, of course, is, you know, this is one of the uh, history's premier harmony bands, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so obviously, you know, there's a metaphor there. Um, but uh, the idea that these, you know, and one of the great things about their, you know, as a band was just, you know, that vocal blend that they had and how closely their their voices, you know, blended together. Um, but then the idea that, you know, the, the tragic thing is that they can't sing together because they hate each other so much <laughs> or they're so busy, you know, engaging in hostilities. But, you know, in, in some ways you might almost think that Mike's need to sue Brian over and over and over again has as much to do with his wanting to have a relationship with the guy. Because as long as they're in court, you know, as long as they're, you know, that they're engaging in a kind of a perverse way, hmm. you know. Well, there's nothing so, they can get in discovery you haven't put in the book. Pardon me? There's nothing they can get in discovery. What's the point now, you know? Well, you never know, I guess. But in some ways, I can't remember if where I heard this or if I said this or whatever, but, but, but suing Brian is the only way that Mike knows how to say I love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Mike Love is the one, of course, who keeps the machine on the road doing those oldies, uh, well, oldies shows, I guess you'd call them, every, every year. Mm -hmm. um, is his motivation, does he, you know, does he love being on stage, or is it to keep the Beach Boys alive, or is it, uh, you know, is it just the old-fashioned, that's what he does for a living, and he's going to keep working? I think yes to everything you, <laughs> I mean, it, for the same reason, why does Paul McCartney hit the road, you know? He, uh, clearly, he doesn't need the money. I mean, you might say Mike needs the money. I don't know what his finances are like. He's gone bankrupt a couple times or more. <laughs> um, so, you know, clearly he's got a little financial uh, organization skills lacking. But, uh, you know, McCartney is a multi-billionaire, I think. And yet, you know, you see him on stage and it's like, well, A, he can really do it, and B, you know, you have to think this is what gives his life meaning. This is what he does. You know, what else is he going to do? Garden, you know, or whatever. <laughs> uh, and the same with these guys. You know, they've been doing it since they were kids. It, well, life is to them. And so, you know, what else is there? Just before you were on, Peter, we interviewed, uh, I interviewed Tom Adratus, who has a new book on Diana Ross. Uh -huh. And we were discussing the, the Supremes reunion that didn't happen. Right. And the Beach Boys and the Supremes are two of the major American groups that have enough members that should really just settle their differences. It's the parallels kind of funny because uh, the fans would celebrate if they would get it together. You know, I have to say, um, I kind of disagree about the Beach Boys. I just sort of feel like, you know, so much of the band was Carl Wilson, for instance. And I think, and even after Dennis was gone, I mean, something that, you know, important was missing from the chemistry, which in some ways was, you know, a sense of danger, you know, a sense of you know, roughness around the edges, which I think really gave them, uh, you know, some snap. Um, I, but really without Carl's voice and, and without his kind of, I think, sweetness, I think, you know, you really lack something. And, you know, you get to a point where the chemistry is altered or gone completely, and that band that you knew and loved is just it just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, you could kind of, you know, if you squint, you know, or close one eye, you could see them and think, yeah, those are the guys. But, but on the other hand, I kind of feel like, you know, in the same way that you don't want Paul and Ringo to, you know, tap a couple different guys and go out and say, hey, we're the Beatles again, you know, because as beautiful as the Beatles were, you know, that's that's over now. Um, and you might almost say that bands that, you know, you get beyond a certain point and the thing, the essence that drew them together is, is, is gone. And, and it's better just to live with, you know, your memories or the old videos and, and, and leave it at that um, and let them go on to something new. I mean, I can't think of a band that really recaptured its essence um, 
after 10 or 20 or 30 or you know more years. I mean, I guess the Velvet Underground came close in the early 90s, but uh, but even that didn't last very long. So you th do you think it was a wise decision by Brian to go and record the Smile album and to do it with his new uh, collaborators and not bring in uh, the other members even to do a vocal or two or something like that? Yeah, I do, because I think that those guys, you know, I, I think they made it clear, you know, 20, 25 years ago that they had really lost all interest in Brian as an artist. I mean, they like him as an annuity. They like him as a guy that might conceivably, you know, give them a lot more um, media attention and therefore more, you know, thicker streams of money. Um, and maybe even write a song that sounds so much like the way old stuff that, um, you know, that, that they could see it going on the, on the record charts. But, um, you know, there have been enough times where he has really offered his services as a creative songwriter and producer, and they've essentially said, no, forget it, we're not interested. You know, because I think they feel like he's a big pain in, in the behind, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's too quirky and weird, and, and also, they, you know, they've gotten used to having a lot more authority over their work and their band, and they don't want to cede that to him anymore. And I think, you know, he and probably particularly his wife figured, you know, what do we, what do we need that anxiety for? And, uh, you know, so there's a complete, I think, a near complete disconnect, but, you know, creatively between them. And his new band, I mean, these are guys who are, you know, not only extraordinarily talented, dedicated musicians, but they're, you know, they worship the guy. Um, not to the extent that they'll do, you know, every damn thing he tells them to do, but, you know, I think they know what he's capable of, and they value it, and they do everything in their power to, to make it happen. I'm uh, myself a fan uh, greatly of their music that they recorded for Warner Brothers in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and that was a period much more of um, collaboration among the group in which each member would get a couple of songs on mm -hmm. the album. And um, I was wondering what your, your own opinion was of the, let's say, the uh, Surf's Up, and the, I know you mentioned uh, Sail on Sailor, which of course is from Holland, and uh, the, the Sunflower album and the others that they had in, in that early 70s period. Yeah, no, I'm a huge fan of those records. I mean, Brian was obviously a big part of Sunflower from 1970 and, you know, contributed a few great songs to Surf's Up. Um, you know, but by the time you get to Holland, which was, I think, very early 73, uh, the other guys had really reached a level of, you know, uh, of song you know, songwriting and uh, performing where, you know, they essentially made that entire album without Brian or with minimal Brian participa par participation. And yet, you know, it's just great song after great song. That's one of my favorite Beach Boy records, um, though it doesn't really have a whole lot in common with their, you know, their, their early to mid-60s stuff. It's got a really nice kind of funky down-home quality. You know, it, it fits right in to me, you know, with Working Man's Dead and American Beauty and, uh, you know, the good, the great Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young stuff from the early 70s or the Flying Burrito Brothers, you know, I mean, it has a whole other kind of down-home, back-to-the-land kind of vibe to it. Um, you know, and, but that's got a lot to do with Dennis's songwriting and Carl's songwriting and, uh, you know, and even Mike and, and Al wrote great songs for that record. But, you know, I think that's, those are spectacular albums. And I think, you know, there was a brief moment of time when they weren't quite so popular anymore and the cultural wheel had turned to the extent where they really had to commit themselves to their own artistry because that was kind of, you know, in those days, you know, the glory days of the counterculture and the post-Woodstock era, that's, that's what sold. Um, and they really, you know, kind of became these groovy, hippie-type guys. And um, it was neat, you know. They really, you know, they played a, they would play a couple, three oldies per show, but mostly they played their new music, and it was really, really good stuff. And, uh, you know, I think they were really, at, you know, for a moment determined to recreate themselves as a contemporary early 70s band. And uh, they did a great job of it, but the moment that... Uh, you know, Endless Summer came out, it was kind of the death knell for their uh, their attempts to be contemporary. They really surrendered to their own past 
and uh, you know within three or four years they were you know their shows were almost entirely oldies and uh, you know and it's been ever you know, it's been the same way for you know now going on 30 years and yeah, truth be told, the, the album they did after that, the 15, called 15 Big Ones Celebrating Their 15th Anniversary was, I think, to most Beach Boy fans from the era, a major disappointment because it did show a kind of uh, creative backward step as opposed to forward step. Do you, do you think that way too, Peter? Yeah, you know, I remember when that rec you know, buying that record when it came out, and it's got like a small handful of really cool songs on it. I mean, it, the irony, of course, is that that was, you know, supposedly marking Brian's big return to, uh, you know, to create a flower, um, you know, because he was big, they kind of dragged him out of his self-imposed uh, retirement and, um, and, you know, threw him back in the studio and essentially commanded him to, you know, produce a new record for them. Um, and which he did, and some of the songs are really cool, and, but you know you can kind of tell his heart's not into it. Um, a year later, he uh, produced uh, a record that came to be known as the Beach Boys Love You, and that is you know all Brian Wilson originals, and I think he's playing virtually every instrument on the record, and uh, and that's a much more interesting, quirky, cool record um, with a lot of bizarro songs on it which are like endlessly fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a big commercial bomb, and I think that was the point at which they said, you know what, Brian, you know, screw it, we're, we're, we're taking back control. But by then, you know, the guys wanted to write their own songs, but they were consciously and egregiously attempting to revive the themes that, you know, from the earliest songs. So suddenly they're writing surfing tunes again, and singing about their cars, but only now they're in their mid-30s, and, <laughs> you know, to, <laughs> to the extent that they ever knew about surfing as a first-hand thing, which, you know, they didn't know much, they, um, you know, this was disastrous, you know, a disastrous mis misstep for them, uh, and I think, you know, it was all downhill from there. But when they did come up with a, a solo hit like Kokomo, yeah, um, they, I think they had trouble selling that because uh, Critique Records in Woburn, which was a... Um, one of the record men, you know, the independent promotion guys. Uh -huh. Critique was uh, Carl Strube's label, and I believe that it was offered to them, and they might have passed on it. So here's this master being passed around, and it hit number one. Yeah, well, that was one, you know, but that, in, in some ways, um, uh, it came out ultimately as on the soundtrack of that uh, Tom Cruise movie, Cocktail. But even that, and, and I think it may have even been, uh, 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 you know, sort of called it, you know, or ordered up specifically for that soundtrack. Um, but it was a song that John Phillips from the Mamas and Papas and, uh, you know, a few other guys had written. I mean, I think there's like five songwriters on that tune. Correct. And the extent to which Mike Love, you know, whose name is on the song too, you know, it was mo a much more of an editing job. And he wrote that kind of Beach Boy sounding like bass vocal that he sings, you know, with all that alliterative stuff about, you know, Jamaica, I want to take you, you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and he also is very proud of the fact that, you know, John Phillips had, had written the tune as a, uh, in the past tense, like we used to go to Kokomo, you know, and he said that it made us sound like a bunch of codgers, you know, so he put it in the present tense. We're still going. Look, this is what we do, which is, you know, probably a good call for him. And the tune's got a great vocal arrangement, which to me is, it's, you know, the great charm of the record, but uh, you know it's it's pretty fluffy. It, it doesn't have a whole lot of uh, viscera to it. You know, I don't think it really captures the same kind of tension and drama that uh, that Brian's best work does. And if it was uh, made for the movie, then what I told you was probably ur urban legend. But I did hear it back in the day when it hit. Maybe it was floating around as a John Phillips. Uh, you know, I think Barry McGuire. No, not Barry McGuire, but Scott McKenzie. Pardon? Scott McKenzie? Yeah, McKenzie is on it. So it's all like these L.A. <laughs> rock dudes that have been around forever and ever and ever, you know. But um, but anyway, so they all had that great moment of glory in 1988. They, they, they should have been written a song about the summer of love again then with all those guys on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, a buck's a buck, so... <laughs> Well, I guess it does show what you what, what you do, uh, you know, conclude about Mike Love that he does have, 
you know, while his gifts may be narrow and limited, they, when, when, they, when they are directed and focused, they can be uh, pretty profitable. He's got a great ear for, you know, or at least at times has, has shown that he has an ear for, uh, you know, the popular vernacular and uh, pop music. Um, and I think he did, you know, one of his, one of his great achievements was, was really sort of, I think, emphasizing R&B. And, uh, you know, and, and his interest in soul music, I think, really gave the Beach Boys a, you know, a you know, bit of more of a dimension. I mean, Brian was also, and Carl, I think, were also big R&B fans, too. But, uh, you know, and one of the things that people don't really talk about when it comes to Brian and the Beach Boys are, you know, what synthesis they were. A song like Surfing USA, you know, began as a Chuck Berry tune. So it's St. Louis, you know, R&B, rock and roll. You know, meanwhile, they're, you know, Brian sifting in surf guitar and jazz harmonies from the four freshmen and, you know, throwing it all together, blending it all together and throwing it onto the beach. And, you know, and suddenly everyone in America can identify with this, even though, you know, he's singing about something that 99 percent of Americans would never do. Peter, Brian, who has written these really brilliant songs and brilliant uh, arrangements and harmonies, he, he didn't have much of a music education, did he? No, you know, I think he took a couple classes in high school, maybe one or two in junior college, uh, but most of everything he just absorbed, you know, through osmosis, through listening, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think he's what you call a native genius. Um, mm -hmm. He just, uh, you know, some guys can just pull it out of thin air, and he's one of them. Did he have perfect pitch with the ability to do those vocal harmonies, do you think? Um, you if not perfect, then something very close to it. I mean, and the other crazy thing is that he's, you know, as most people know, he's nearly entirely deaf in one ear. So, uh, you know, he comes at it with this kind of handicap. But on the other hand, you know, maybe that's a handicap that, uh, you know, that, that turned into the, you know, the, 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 the foundation of his, genius. I mean, maybe he just hears everything differently than you and I do. But he definitely, I mean, obviously something different's going on because he's, you know, you just have to listen to one or two of his songs to realize that this is a guy with a very special sense of music. I, I found your commentary in, uh, in your book, uh, Catch a Wave, um, I found your, your commentary about Rhapsody in Blue uh, rather eye-opening. Could you go into that a little bit, Peter? Brian's relationship with Rhapsody in Blue, it was, uh, I think he, he recalls hearing it as about a two-year-old, you know, lying down in his grandmother's apartment in uh, Englewood, California, and hearing this fantastic music sort of, you know, flying through the air at him and being, and at the time he said, or he has said that he could hear like every aspect of his life encapsulated in those notes. And it's, you know, it is, you know, one of the key, uh, uh, signposts in his life, and you can hear him. You know, you can hear that influence in in so many of his better works. I mean, I think consciously he set out to make good vibrations, a pocket version of of Rhapsody in Blue, just thinking in terms of how it has these very distinct sections that kind of weave together in unexpected ways. I mean, with different sounds and different instruments um, and different moods, and uh, and it worked. I think I think he was so pleased with how it worked on Good Vibrations. That's why he wanted to make Smile, um, you know, the follow-up album, a uh, you know, in exactly the same way, with just you know, sections that blended into one another without distinct or often without distinct endings and beginnings, but just with these kind of melodic transitions and and little digressions that would link these things together. Um, you know, so so Gershwin was a big influence, and, and you know, and and and, uh, and and so was I think Stephen Foster, particularly when you get into that mid to late '60s stuff. Uh, again, you know, another American artist who was you know uh, sifting a lot of cultural ideas and a lot of ideals into into music in unexpected ways. Um, but uh, you know, so. You know, and again, I mean, talk about the guy as a as as a as a synthesis and his ability to take, you know, this very seemingly uh, southern Gothic type of music, you know, these pop songs that 
Stephen Foster's writing in the early 19th century and weaving them together with, you know, Gershwin's very urban sound from the early 20th century and somehow blending that all into the rock and roll of the, you know, the 1960s. And, uh, you know, and what emerged are these songs, you know, Good Vibrations, uh, Heroes and Villains, you know, and on and on, these, these wonderfully complex little pop gems that contain so many different aspects and so many different instruments and sounds and feelings that, uh, you know, and I think that's why guys like me and, you know, a million other guys are endlessly fascinated with Brian and his work. Not unlike George Martin's contributions to the Beatles. Yeah, you know, I mean, and I think, you know, I mean, you think about the Beatles and the creative team at the hub of that band, you know, John and Paul and George Martin all working together. Uh, and Brian did those three jobs on his own, by and large, which is one reason why I think it was difficult for him to sustain it, because he didn't have any, ultimately, when it came, when he was out there on the, uh, you know, the creative horizons, he, he didn't have the kind of support system that, uh, that John and Paul had with one another and with George Martin. So was that the pursuit of a uh, Van Dyke Parks? Uh, was he looking for that kind of yeah, sounding board? Yeah, I think board? so. You know, Van, I mean, that's sort of the role that Van Dyke and Tony would have, but you know, it was much more complicated because they were outsiders. Mm -hmm. And the Beach Boys, you know, like any close you know, family, were extraordinarily suspicious of and resentful of outsiders. And particularly a guy like Van Dyke, who was a very strong personality and, uh, you know, had very strong ideas and was well-educated and, and extraordinarily sophisticated and uh, really didn't, <laughs> was not in the mood to take crap from Mike Love or, or anybody. And, you know, when that began to happen, I think he figured, well, you know, screw it, I've, I've got better things to do. And, uh, and he did, so off he went. You portray um, that well in the book, too, with the, the tension. It would, it's a good movie of the week. Yeah. Yeah, there is. There's a lot of potential there. I mean, it's just—it's a very gothic and strange and <laughs> unsettling story. But uh, you know, I mean, and the only, to me, I mean, the great thing about it is the fact that it ends so unexpectedly with this sense of redemption. That even after, you know, all this destruction and and this emotional dissolution that Brian suffered, um, and a near complete creative. Uh, all, he, you know, very late in life pulled out of it and managed to dust off the one, you know, the one project that had really become so emblematic of his destruction, um, and not only revive it, but, you know, but, and not only finish it, but have it be as good as it is. I mean, that's a pretty extraordinary thing. So when you, in the title of your book, um, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption, of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson is, is redemption, specifically referring to the Smile Project, which he completed what within the last couple of few years. Largely, yeah. I mean, I think that was really the you know, I mean, that's huge. I mean, you can't really get around that. But I think also just the fact that you know, starting in around the mid to late '90s, I mean, he really became a you know a fairly vital, uh, very productive. Um, artist and you not only in the studio but you know uh, as a touring musician and I think what he was really able to do you know when he formed his own band and, and hit the road and started playing his own music his own way was to take back his 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 uh, legacy which had been I think mutated by Mike and you know the other boys into a kind you know into this nostalgia mongering type of thing. You know, they're so into talking about the 60s man and, you know, and being so connected to people's nostalgic sensibility. And what Brian did by, I think, playing a, a different combination of music and showing the connections between his later work and his early work was to reassert himself as an artist and to reacquaint people with the, you know, the, the depth, the range and the depth of his artistry. And reminding them that these tunes, you know, they're not just fun. They're not, you know, even the early hits. Yeah, they're fun. They're great. You know, you can dance to them or whatever. But they're also pretty phenomenal works of art. And, uh, you know, played in the appropriate way, in the appropriate context, suddenly you're reminded, like, how breathtaking these tunes 
cartoons really are and how innovative. Um, and and that to me was a you know it's a huge huge thing. I mean, go to these shows in the ninety you know the late nineties and the early even before Smile, and you'd see people bursting into tears just because you know I think that his you know he really was reconnecting with that really sweet, touching, you know, inspiring sensibility that, it, you know, that, that his best music has. Well, I think on his, on his first choice, did he not do um, in its entirety the, his uh, Pet Sounds album? Yeah, he was doing that for, I think, in 2000 and, uh, you know, through around 2002. And now he's, 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 he's doing it again. I think he played a show in Boston, didn't he, a couple months ago? Um, and that was a big step. I mean, just because that was a record that for so many years people had, uh, you know, that was viewed as kind of a, uh, you know, it took a long, long time for people to get beyond the fact that it was like the first step in the Beach Boys' popular collapse, you know, because it wasn't as huge a hit as the earlier albums had been. Um, and it was a record that, you know, the other Beach Boys really didn't connect with and had criticized, or certainly Mike had criticized, um, you know, possibly because it coincided with the point when Brian kind of, you know, his personal dissolution was beginning. Um, but, you know, he was also doing fantastic work then, which they found very difficult to connect with. But, uh, you know, and, and certainly the Beach Boys had never played that album in its entirety, you know, if only because it was so hard to play and required yeah. so much, you know, attention and you know, I guess you, you could be guaranteed of a standing ovation for every single tune. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, when Brian began, you know, had his band and and they were capable of playing all those different instruments and really bringing those arrangements to life, um, you know, it was a, it was a pretty huge deal. I, I read in your book, um, Peter, that at the time he was doing Pet Sounds recording it, he actually had started fooling around with good vibrations. And it struck me that if he had completed it and put that on Pet Sounds, we'd be talking probably about Pet Sounds in the same way we talk about Sgt. Pepper, because it would have been huge, because of course Good Vibrations was their biggest single, I guess, of the 60s. Yeah, you know, but still I think he consciously decided not to put it on the record because its sound and its feeling was so different from the more melancholy you know, mood that he was trying to create on uh, on on pet sounds i mean it's it, it just structurally and the way that it's recorded and, and what he's trying to do with it musically you know again with that more symphonic sense um was going to fit much more on you know much more closely on the next record which was what smile was supposed to be but yeah you know the guys now or you know i've, I've seen the beach boys you know, saying the same thing, like, oh, man, if he'd only put it on Pet Sounds, that would have been huge, and everything would have changed, you know, because it would have been such a huge success. He would have been, you know, inspired to go onward. But success has never been, <laughs> you know, he had a huge success. They all had a huge success when Good Vibrations did come out as a single, but it did nothing to, to stop his, his, his collapse. And, in fact, you could almost argue that that level of success, you know, accelerated his collapse. Um, if only because it raised the pressure, because mm -hmm. Capitol Records and, and everybody else was, okay, you got you know, you got to do this again. You know, the moment they had that kind of success, all they wanted was to repeat it, to, you know, to extend it. And, uh, you know, theoretically, given that line of reasoning, I mean, he should have been able to knock off Smile quickly and easily with the momentum that Good Vibrations gave him. But strangely enough, I mean, I think it was the release of that album, you know, it was within weeks of when that song was like the biggest single in the world where he really fell apart completely. Yeah, and, that, uh, and then Smile kept being projected and never actually came out, and then they did Smiley Smile, which was a great disappointment to just about everybody, I think, at the time. Yeah, yeah, though listening to it these days, it, you know, it's, it's a strange and, and thrilling little record right. on its own because it sounds so unlike, you know, virtually every record that had been recorded before or since. Yeah, we were waiting for the next Sgt. Pepper and instead we get, uh, you know, the, the, the strange things on uh, the, the almost underproduced items. Here yeah, on Smiley it was, I think it was Hendrix who called it like the psychedelic barbershop quartet album, <laughs> which is 
which is just about right. You know, it's a, it's a pretty dark and strange little record, but uh, it's got some really lovely moments on it. It's been a few weeks since I've read your book, Peter. Did you bring up the Jimi Hendrix line, uh, you'll never hear surf music again? Yeah, but you know what? That, uh, what I really tried to do, I think, was to debunk what he meant by that because um, uh, it's been taken out of context for so long. I think according to uh, most people who seem actually familiar with Jimmy, um, you know, his actual taste, he was a huge Dick Dale fan. And, and apparently when he uttered that phrase, it was in the studio and he was responding sadly to reports that Dick Dale had, had become terribly ill and might not survive. Um, though, of course, you know, thankfully he did recover and went on to, you know, he's still playing today. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but people just through, for one reason or another, took that to be like a, essentially a throwing down the gauntlet saying, you know, my style of music is what's happening and this old music is dead. But apparently, I mean, I think just the fact that Jimmy played Stratocasters was because Dick Dale played Stratocasters. And, uh, you know, there's a lot about his tone and his sound that goes right back to the heart of uh, surf music. And the Beach Boys, of course, are just an offshoot from real surf music, which is instrumental and you know, much more guitar-based. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that was taken just a wee bit out of context. Peter, we've got about three minutes left, and I want Joe to wrap it up um, when we do. I want to give your website out. What is it? It's um, uh, PeterAmesCarlin.com. PeterAmesCarlin.com. Yeah. And uh, the book is, oh, I have it in front of me. It's a long title. It's Catch a Wave, The Rise, The Fall, and Redemption of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson. And uh, one other thing, one little anecdote I'm going to make is uh, Robert Greenfield was on our show and uh -huh. he did a book on the Rolling Stones, yeah, A Season in Hell. And Robert was there. You weren't there, but your book reads like you were there. <laughs> well, I was there for part of the later years, but yeah. Um, I, well, you know, I mean, I spent a lot of time debriefing people who were there, um, you know, and, and stood on the shoulders of a lot of writers who, who did great stuff earlier on. So, uh, so I had the benefit of a lot of very wise and uh, intelligent people. But it was a compliment. You, it really reads like you were there at the early days. Oh, thank you. It, it reads very well. Peter, we're going to just ask you two things to wrap it up with. First, are you working on another book yourself at this point? And second, are you aware of anything uh, Brian Wilson is working on for the future? Well, um, am I working on a book? I, not yet. I mean, I'm a, I'm a TV critic by day here at the Oregonian newspaper, and, and that takes up a lot of my time and attention. Um, you know, I've got some ideas. I'm kicking them around for another book, and, uh, you know, maybe something will get going uh, in the next few months. Um, and what Brian's up to, I just saw some stuff today that he's apparently booked to do some shows in London in September, which is going to be the premiere of some new work of his. And, uh, you know, and I don't know exactly, you know, if it's a, if, it, if it's a larger kind of conceptual type of work, which it kind of sounds that way, or whether it's just a bunch of new tunes. I know he's been in the studio working with his band members, um, you know, for the, you know, on and off for the last few months. And, uh, you know, what I heard is that some of the songs are, are really good, but, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what he's got up his sleeve. Well, Peter, Peter Ames, Colin, you've taken us on a nice trip uh, across the Beach Boy history and Beach Boy music, and it's uh, been fascinating talking to you and uh, hearing some of your perceptions uh, on their personalities and their music. Well, thanks very much. Thanks a lot, man, and you're always welcome in our studio when you're in Boston. Hey, thanks. I'd love to. Great. All right, guys. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. And that's Visual Radio for... Uh, January 25th, 2007. My God, show 373, Joe. Can you believe it? No. <laughs> I can't either. Thanks to uh, Mike, Tiny, and uh, Kurt, and everyone at the uh, WCAT Winthrop.